It's in times like this. We can't allow ourselves to act like that world out there. You're not being drawn into chaos, right? You're not being drawn into chaos, right? Don't be removed. Natalie was talking about peace. Don't let chaos pull you out of peace. Don't, don't get carried away and drawn right into the, all of the confusion. My Bible says, my God is not the author of confusion, but he is the prince of peace. All right. All right, we got that, right? We can't be lured into turmoil, chaos, and confusion with that world out there. Don't be lured. Don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. It's being teased right in front of you, right? Jonathan's been catching some big old bass off of beds lately. He's bunches of them, big old things. And the way you do that is you keep dropping the bait in front of them. And they may not bite it. And you drop it in front of them. And you drop it in front of them. And after a while, he told me the other day they stayed after one fish for how many hours? About four hours after one fish that he was going to let go anyway. But anyway, keep dropping the bait in front of them. Dropping the bait in front. And after a while, guess what? They just get so fed up with it that they bite. And then they're hooked. Don't get so fed up that you bite. Don't, don't be lured into chaos. Don't be lured into confusion. That's not for you. That's not for you. That's not for you. If anything, we should see how quickly everything could change. Did you think everything could change that quick? Like that. Everything changed. I just wanted to eat my sausage on a bun. Not an option. Three days ago, could you imagine a week ago thinking that within a week, you couldn't go to the dollar store and buy the things you needed? Did, could you imagine that? If a week ago somebody would ask you, you thought they were crazy. But it happened just like that. I'm not, look, I'm not going to preach on this, I promise you. But we ought to recognize how quickly things can change. How quickly everything, could, last Sunday, would, would you have believed that a huge percentage of the church would not be meeting this morning because someone said you can't? If somebody had asked you that a week ago, what would you have said? That, that never happened. This is America. And that don't happen in America. But we ought to realize from this instance, from this event, how quick that all the things that we say can't happen could happen just like that. Don't be drawn in. It should be a wake-up call for us how fast our America can change. We have to remain vigilant. We have to remain vigilant. And most importantly, prayerful. We need to be a people of prayer. I know it feels good to fuss about it. I've done that too. But make sure we pray about it. Make sure we pray more than we fuss. It aggravates me, and I'm sure it aggravates most of you. But we have to make sure we do more than complain. We have to pray. We have to be a people of prayer. We have to be a praying people. If, if the church refuses to pray, look, what's the scripture say? If my people who are called by my name, who is that? That's us. If they would repent and turn from their wicked ways, then I'd do what? I'd forgive their sin and... He'll, wait, wait, wait. I will what? I will hear them from heaven. We got to pray. And then I'll heal, heal their land. So who's the responsibility fall on? Us. We're the church. We're the ones with the power of life and death in our mouth. We're the ones that move by the Spirit of God and calling things that be not as though they were. It's us, right? We are the most powerful force in the cosmos. Apart from our Heavenly Father, in human form, we are the most important Power, we are the most powerful force. But not if we sit back and do nothing. Not if we sit back and do nothing. 
All right, like I said, I'm not going to preach on that, I don't think. We just, we're just going to chug right along through. Our country needs our prayers. Our president needs our prayers. In shaky times, we have to recognize the necessity that we have something to, solid to hold on to. We have to realize and recognize and understand that we've got to have something solid to hold on to. Do you have anything solid? Yeah. You got the Word of God. I don't care how much that world out there shakes. The kingdom of God is not shaken. The kingdom of God is not shaken. Hold on to the Word. What's the Word of God say? The Word of God doesn't change. It, and it's not dependent on man's report. Hold on to the Word. Look. This should come as no surprise. Anything that happens in this world should not shock us or catch us off guard. We, 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 have the, we got the whole book to read, and it tells us all about it, right? You ever read that last book? It tells you all about this stuff. Don't let it catch you off guard. Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is what? A strong tower. The righteous can run to it, and they're what? safe the name of the Lord all caps see that what did we learn from that a while ago I am Yahweh the name of the Lord is a strong tower I can run to him and I'm safe I'm safe well what's that mean remember when you were a kid and you, and you played hide and go seek or tag and you had a, a base and when you got to the base, you were safe. And it didn't matter what came against you. You were already on base. Well, the name of the Lord is a strong tower that you can run to, and you're safe. And no matter what happens in the world, it can't get me. I'm safe. I'm on base. When the world's rocking, the kingdom remains unshaken. We have to remember our promises, or as Terry Myers taught us, our purchases. What has God promised and the blood of God purchased for us that makes us different than the average Walmart shopper? You're not just like them. You're different. I've been told I was different all my life. I believe it. I'm peculiar. That's what the Bible says. I'm a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that I should show forth the praises of him that's called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Who's he talking about? Us. We're not like everybody else. There's something different. You've got a God who promised he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you, that sets you apart. That makes you a little different. Am I the only one here that's a little different? No, I know most of you. Some of you share my DNA. I know you're different. But more than just in the makes people go, hmm, more than just in that way, the Spirit of God lives in you. And that ought to set you apart. Are y'all with me? Calm down then. I can't preach when you're jumping over chairs like that. Calm down. And I, I titled this, The Promises of Psalm 23. Psalm, you know, and I, I had seen a little thing that somebody had, had typed out, and they kind of broke it down into what each verse in that meant. But I just took it deeper and, and really explored that because this psalm is so rich. You know, David, David, pen this psalm but it was inspired in him by the Holy Spirit right we understand that and David the life of David and the, and the, the person of David is he's always intrigued me God said that's he's a man after my own heart so when God says that about somebody we ought to look at him was he perfect no did he mess up a lot he messed up a lot but God never ran out listen to, I'm talking I'm talking to somebody he messed up a lot he probably messed up more than any of you but God never ran out on him. 
God never forsaken him, has, has, had never forsaken him. God never left him alone. God always directed his steps. God always met him where he was. God never said, you've done too much. He was an adulterer, right? He conceived a child out of wedlock with the woman that he was having an affair with. And then to hide it all, he had her husband killed. He was not father of the year. His own son hunted him down to try to kill him. You know, there were some, some great victories in his life, obviously, but there were some huge defeats. But God said, no matter what, I love you because your heart's toward me. You seek my heart. He said, you're a man that's after my heart. You want to capture the very heart of God. No matter how much he messed up, look, you haven't done too much. You haven't done too much where God's run out on you. I'll just read. The Lord is my shepherd. We could probably, most of us, quote that, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. You can write it with, read it with me. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup runs over surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever that's the guy I was just talking about and he pins something like that because the Holy Spirit brought it up inside of him let's look at that look at the promises that are here I believe that if we take this psalm we can and really believe it and really digest it, gnaw on it, regurgitate it, and rechew it. I preached a sermon on that. We'll have to pull it back up and I'll sell it for nineteen ninety five. It ought to be in the archive somewhere. It's called Regurgitate and Rechew. Check it out. It's pretty interesting. God gave it to me. I don't take any credit for that. I'm not near that smart. But if we do that with this with this psalm, I think it would help us weather any storm. So let's look at it a little bit. Let's break it down. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's just leave it at that. The Lord is my shepherd. This speaks of our relationship. This is our relationship with God. What's my relationship with God like? Well, he's my shepherd. That must make me a what? Sheep. If the Lord is my shepherd, I must be his sheep. But I have to choose to be a sheep. I have to choose to be a sheep. I have to submit myself to God. I have to surrender to him. I have to let him be my shepherd. I don't want to be a sheep for that world out there. You, you know what I'm talking about? That are just led around by any news report or anything that's happening. And they're just... And that, there's, there's nothing about that that says strength. But when I'm a sheep in the flock of the Lord, that's a little different. That's a little different. Now I've got somebody watching over me. Now I've got somebody leading me who knows exactly where I need to be, exactly what, no matter how it looks to me. That's the thing. It doesn't matter how it looks to me if I surrender to the, to the good shepherd. So the Lord is my shepherd. Everybody say, my shepherd. My shepherd. That's personal. He's my shepherd. I don't know about you, but as far as it concerns me, God is my shepherd. God is my shepherd. Well, what's that mean to me? Well, that means I have a relationship with him, but it also means I don't call the shots. Because sheep don't call the shots over the shepherd. The sheep don't tell the shepherd where they need to go. The shepherd leads the sheep. And here's the thing. The shepherd don't tell the sheep where they need to go either. He leads them. Then the sheep have to choose to follow. The shepherd is the leader, caretaker, protector, provider of the sheep. And the sheep are surrendered to the leading of the shepherd. A goat resists the leading of the shepherd and chooses his own path. A goat butts everything. Don't be a goat. A goat butts everything. I believe, but, I trust, but, I know, but, I would, but. Don't let your butt get in the way. Keep your butt out of the way. Because your butt will keep you from receiving what God has for you. 
Your blood will keep you from the protection, provision, the, and, and everything that the shepherd desires to lead you into. And when he leads you, you said, I would follow, but... Well, now, when you start butting things, you no longer look like a sheep. You look more like a goat. And the difference between a sheep and a goat, the Lord talks about when he, he says, I'll, I'll put the sheep on my right side and the goats on my left. And the way he divides those two is strictly based on relationship. Because the goats cry out, you're my God. But Lord, I did miracles in your name. But Lord, and what's his response? But I, depart from me because I never knew you. We never had a relationship. We never formed a relationship. The Lord is my shepherd. That's my relationship with God. And it's based on me being surrendered as a sheep. I shall not want. He's our provision. He's my supernatural supply. He's my supernatural supply. I shall not be in want. I shall not be in lack. Whatever my need, my God supplies. Whatever my need, my God supplies. Well, what do you need? God promises to be your supplier. He promises to be your provider. His name's Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. He named himself that. I am Jehovah Jireh, your God who will provide for you. It's not a task for him. It's what he does. It's not even what he does. It's who he is. Provider is who he is. Provider is who he is. Don't be concerned with how am I going to get toilet paper. My God provides. I know that's funny. But whatever the need is, whatever the need is, I don't know what your need is. But trust God as provider. Pro trust God for provi as provider. Because I follow the good shepherd who ensures I have everything that I need, because I follow the good shepherd, he ensures that I have everything I need. Is it up to those sheep to provide for themselves? Look, the Lord calling a sheep, that is no great compliment. I don't know if you knew that or not. That's not known for being the utmost of intelligent creature. They depend on that shepherd because without him, they're not going to make it. I never raise sheep. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I've talked to people who do, and they said a sheep is born looking for somewhere to die. So I don't know a whole lot about them, but I know they don't do well on their own. Somebody has to provide for them because they're a needy creature. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about us. We don't do well on our own. I don't do well on my own. I've seen me left alone to my own devices. It's not pretty. In fact, if she leaves for more than about 30 minutes, I'm calling her, when are you going to be back? Because I don't do well alone. I don't do well unsupervised. I'm not the only one out here like that either. My God will meet all of my needs. My God will not leave me in want. Look, if he has to feed me with a raven, through a raven, he'll do it. If he has to make water flow out of a rock, he'll do it. If he has to multiply fish and bread for me, he'll do it. Do you, do you understand what I'm talking about? Whatever my God needs to do, he'll do it. But I will not be in want. I will not be in lack. I'm not saying that there's things that I, I want that I don't have. I'm talking about things I need. I'm talking about being in want. I'm talking about living in lack. My God said, I'll supply your need. I will supply your need. I'm a good shepherd, and I'm going to lead you if you follow me, and I'm going to lead you to the place where you're going to have everything that you need. Are y'all getting this? Don't keep looking at your lack. Look at your God. Look to your God who promises. If he's got a part of sea, he'll part of sea. He's done it before. It's not a big deal. He's God. 
You understand that? It's a big deal to us. It's not a big deal to God. I could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on about the times my God has met my need. Couldn't I? Those of you who are close, y'all know what I'm talking about. I've shared these accounts with you. I've shared lifting the pot, lid off my pot and finding an envelope full of money and just a note on it that says, God bless you. I lifted a pot lid. There's something about me and pot lids. Maybe that's why I like to cook so much. I lifted a pot lid in a store. In a store. I, lift, I, just, I like pots. I like to cook. I lifted this pot lid. I looked. There's money in the pot. On the shelf at the store. We need to lift more pot lids. <laughs> oh, my God will supply my need. I've seen him do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. But you have to trust him. We have to trust him. We have to trust him. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Dead pastures. Bearing ground on a rock. He said green pastures. That's fertile ground. That's good ground. Lay down. Does that look like I'm working for it and toiling after it? Now, does God expect me to work? Yes. But does it mean I'm struggling to get it? And uh, uh, That's my focus. Does that sound like that? No, he said, you just lay down and rest in it because I'm your shepherd and I'm leading to you to the place where you can lay down right in the middle of abundance. Green pasture sounds like abundance to me. You ever, you ever laid in green grass? You ever laid in rye grass? Doesn't that feel good? It's so cold. It's thick and lush and pretty and green and full of nutrients. And you can just lay down and it's cold. Let the snake crawl on you. I messed that whole picture up, huh? Dad was telling a story about that yesterday because I was going to throw a snake at him one time. And I picked it up and it bit me. Stupid snake. And my dad said that was good for me. I still pick them up. It doesn't matter. But he makes me lie down in green pastures. That's rest. Hey, you ever need rest? And I'm not just talking about physically. I'm talking about mentally. You ever need rest? You never need emotional rest. God said, just let me be your shepherd, and I'm going to bring you to the place where you can just lay down right in the middle of abundance and take you a good nap if you want to. It's not toying after or worrying about. I said it's not worrying about. That's just resting in the middle of it. The world runs to and fro looking for provision. And God said we can just rest in the middle of it if I don't start running with them. I can choose. I can lay down in it and rest with my God with the assurance that He's going to provide for me and not just provide, not just enough to scrape by, but abundance. Or I can run with the world and chase after it. It's up to me. He'll let me do whichever one I want. I suggest letting him lead you to the place where you can rest. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me beside still waters. That's refreshing. Still waters are refreshing. That speaks to me as a hunter because I don't hunt next to running water. I have learned that because a deer don't like running water. He can't hear by running water. So he's going to go around that. He's going to look for a, a place where there's not a lot of noise. That's why deer don't move in the wind because they can't hear and they can't smell. God said, I'll lead you to a place that's refreshing where you can rest and you're not even disturbed. Refreshing. If you need refreshing, God said, follow me, and that's where I'm leading you to. If you follow me, you get refreshed, you get restored, you get renewed. Right in the middle of abundance, right in the middle of my provision. No matter what's going on around me, I can be refreshed, refreshed and relaxed. 
If I don't allow, or if I, if I allow the shepherd to lead me to that place, he restores my soul. That's mental and emotional healing. You ever need your emotions healed? You ever get your feelings hurt and just need them healed? If not, I welcome you to the ministry. Come on in the ministry and see if your feelings get hurt from time to time when you pour your life into someone, when you're there in their most agonizing time, when you're, when you're there in the middle of the night when they got a family crisis going on and you, and you pour yourself into them and you, you, you take from what you were even trusting God for and you give to them so they could have that and then you meet them in town and they don't even look at you and they turn, to turn away and you just feel like somebody ripped your heart out over and over and over again. And sometimes we just have to be to the place where we can receive emotional healing because there's a world out there that's full of drama and trauma and we'll end up with all kind of scars because you know what? We can't es escape all of the drama. You know, I, I used to watch our pastor that we grew up under and I saw the hurt that he endured and I said, you know what? I'll never do that. Now, I knew I was called to, to the ministry, so I just said, I'll just be an evangelist because, you know, they just go and preach and they leave and they don't deal with them people. Because I saw how, here's the thing about sheep, they bite. Sheep bite. So I saw the pain that my pastor went through and I said, I'll never do that. So I told that to Natalie one day. She said, good, because I'll never be a pastor's wife. So we were in agreement. And then God said, oh, yeah? Well, here you go. And then he, but he changed our heart. And it's worth it. You hear? It's worth it. You, do those people come along? Yeah. But then there's also the ones that come alongside of you that, that are there and they're faithful. And, and I thank God for you. But no matter what, no matter what you face, no matter what you deal with, my God says he'll, he'll restore your soul. He'll refresh you. He'll bring you back to that condition where you're restored. What's that mean? Like it was originally. Right? Like it was originally. Or better. Or better. I think about your old yellow truck. It's restored, but it's better, right? It's got modern conveniences on top of the, looking like it used to. It's better than it was. It's been restored. We face trauma and drama or the drama that causes trauma daily. But if I get along with the shepherd, he'll heal my scars and he'll calm my emotions and he'll restore me and bring me back to a place of peace. He leads me in the path of righteousness. He's our guide. He will guide me but I must follow. He will guide me, but I must follow. Me and Stevie and Jonathan, we've all been guides. And sometimes you get those people that they just won't listen to you, right? They just want to do it their way. Well, we can do it your way, or we can kill stuff. But I'm out here every day. <laughs> so if he's my guide, I've got to follow. I can't have my own plan and I can't come up with my own agenda. Never, I, look, never say things like this. I don't know what to do. Don't say that. Never say, I'm so confused. Look, those two phrases, delete that from your vocabulary. I don't know what to do. I'm so confused. Well, you know what? In my own cognitive thinking, I may not know what I'm supposed to do. But I have a God that's all-knowing, and he lives inside of me. And if I just seek him, he's going to lead me into what to do. If I don't keep canceling it out with my words, if I don't keep overriding what he's telling me by my confession, and if I'm so confused, 
How did that happen when I serve a God who's not the author of confusion but the Prince of Peace and he's supposed to be living inside of me? I can't keep letting my mouth override my God. I don't have any business being confused. And there, there should be no confession of not knowing what to do. Now, I may be waiting to hear from God. Yeah, I'm just waiting to hear how I'm instructed. But I know what to do. I'm going to listen to God. That's what I'm going to do. Let's do that. That always works out best. Delete those two phrases. He will lead me in what is morally and justly correct paths of righteousness. Even when it contradicts my natural or my religious beliefs. Because sometimes there's some things that we get so religious about and we think this is how God thinks I should do it or this is what God, how God would have me to do it. Then God will lead you to do something and it contradicted how we thought or what grandma taught us or what religion has said. And it just contradicts that. Because sometimes when you read the word and study the word, some of the things that we've been taught religiously don't really line up. And sometimes God will lead us to do something, and we, when it crosses one of them boundaries that we've established, we'll say, whoa, wait a minute, God, this can't be you. I'm just going to throw a, a for instance out there. For instance, what if God told you to, to bless somebody, but they were rich? I'm talking about stinking rich. I'm not talking about they do okay. I mean, they're rich. But God said, go down there, buy something, give it to them. Bless them. And our religious mind says, no, I'm supposed to give to the poor. Well, usually the poor are poor because they don't know how to handle it anyway. But that rich guy is going to see it and, and take it, and it's going to multiply because he knows what to do with it. But religion will say, no, you don't do that. You just give to the poor. Well, Jesus said, you're going to have the poor with you always. And he said, what you give them, I'll give you back. But he said, when you sow into fertile ground where it's multiplied, guess what? There's more. There's you sow up. I'm just talking about contradicting our religious mindsets. Let God lead you in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake. For his name's sake. That's our purpose. It's all about bringing glory to him, not to me. It's about revealing His glory, not creating something about me. His blessing, provision, abundance, protection, they're all to exalt Him, not to exalt me. You know why God can't bless a lot of people? Because they would immediately turn their back on Him if He blessed them the way He wanted to. Because they would not see a need for him anymore. He corrected me on that personally. When I, when I left my job at the refinery, we were doing pretty good. And I prayed and I said, God, and look, I had all kind of scripture to back it up, right? I need you to bless me financially so I don't have to worry about this anymore. He said, so what you're trying to say is you want me to bless you financially so you won't need me anymore. No, sir. <laughs> no, sir. That is what I meant, but I didn't see it that way. So we're going to change the way I pray. Lord, just give me what I need for now, and when I have another need, I'm going to trust you for that too. Right? For his name's sake. When it's for his name's sake, sake, it makes others want him. When God's blessing in your life is for his name's sake, it don't want them to know, it don't make them want to just know you to get something from you. It makes them want to know you so you can share with them how you get that. And then you have the opportunity to say, my God blesses me. My God blesses me. He takes care of my needs. He leads me to a place of abundance. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Boy, that's encouraging, right? That sounds like a happy place. That's our testing. What is faith if it's never tested? 
What is faith if it's never tested? What is a warrior if there's never a battle? What is strength if there's never resistance? How do you even know what you got if it's never tested? How do you know how much strength you have if you've never gone against resistance? How much faith do you, is in you, do you have in you? How do you even know if it's never been tried? If you've never believed God for something that's beyond your ability to conceive or comprehend? How do you know? Look, it's good sometime. Listen, it's good sometime to go back and look at the past victories. It's good to go back and look at the t trials you went through and the testing that you went through. It's good to go back. What happened with David when Goliath stood before him and he was being tested? He said, wait a minute. I remember when it was a bear. I remember when it was a bear and I punched him in the nose and I killed him. And I, I remember the day when it was a lion and I caught him by his beard and he said, I smote him. Can you imagine? Come on. It's the guy that wrote this. It's the guy that wrote what we're reading right here. He said, I remember when a bear came after my sheep. Actually, he said a she-bear, I think. Came after my a mama bear. Came after my sheep. And I killed it with my hands. And I remember the day when a lion came down. Now, God's comparing himself to a shepherd. Now, David's a shepherd. I remember when a lion came down and I caught it by the beard and I killed it. So what did that do when he was revisiting the victories of the past? It brought him to the place where he said, so who is this uncircumcised Philistine that stands before me cussing my God? Go back over your past victories. Go back over when you saw God come through. We were with some people the other day that I hadn't seen in years and honestly, I didn't even remember and they start sharing with me about how their son had a tumor on his neck. And they brought him, and we laid hands on him, and we prayed. And they said we had to go to a specialist in, in Arkansas. And when the doctor there took the x-ray from here, they said this ain't even the same kid. Because the x-rays are completely different. He said if I didn't see the, the name on the x-rays, I wouldn't even believe it. Because everything that he has in this picture is gone in this picture. So what's that do for me? That boasts me up with pride? No, that says, my God, my God, if you can do that through me, how do I ever dare to put a limit on you? In that same conversation, there was another one right here that said, I remember when my dad had stage four cancer and you prayed for him and God healed him that day. And the next day when he went for surgery, they opened him up and closed him right back and said, because there's nothing there. What's that do? That says, my God is faithful. My God is faithful. And he watches over his word to perform it. And all we have to do is dare to trust him. It, this is all in one place, in one conversation. And it brought up another lady in that same town. This is in another town. And this other lady said, that told us, I came up for prayer and I never even told you what I wanted. But you laid hands on me and you prayed. She said, I was blind in my eye and I've been like that all my life and I left there seeing. And we have to go back and we have to revisit, revisit when we saw God come through and do the miraculous because it'll stir up our faith. If we're never tested, how do we know what we have? If we never walk through a trial, how do we know what we have? But my God said, when you walk through them, I'm there with you. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, a valley is a compromised position. Have you ever been in a compromised position? It's when in the natural, things don't look good for you. It's when it looks like you don't have the upper hand anymore. That's a valley. And a shadow comes from something that's hovering over you. Have you ever been in a compromised position and it seemed like something's hovering over you? God said, I'm there with you. I'm in the valley with you. The good news about the valley is that's where the fertile soil is. And the grass there's gotten more nutrients than anywhere else. And there's always a stream in the valley. That's the anointing. There's always a stream in the valley. There's always the anointing of God in the valley if you look for it. 
you'll grow more in a valley than you grow anywhere. You'll grow all the nutrients from the high ground run down to the valley. And you'll grow more there than anywhere, but nobody wants to be there. Because we have this feeling of something hovering over us. I'm in a compromised position. I've got to get back to the mountaintop. But we've got to learn to appreciate the valley. We've got to learn to appreciate the testing times. The promise is that even though we're in a valley, that we've got a shepherd watching over us. We got a shepherd watching over us. I will fear no evil. Boy, do we need that. I will fear no evil. That's our protection. Our nation seems to be consumed with fear at this moment. But we will not be moved by fear. Only by the leading of the shepherd. Say that with me. I'll not be moved by fear. What you fear... You attract to yourself because it becomes your focus. What you fear, you literally attract to yourself because it becomes your focus. You know the things that you're attra- attra- uh, focused on, you're attracted to, and you attract them to you? How did I get her to attract, be attracted to me? I focused on her. <laughs> Next thing you know, I wore her down till she gave up. But I didn't lose focus. Look what Job said. He said, my greatest fear has come upon me. Well, why did it come upon him? Because he was so focused on his greatest fear. Next thing you knew, it was knocking at his door. Because it becomes our focus. My dad taught me a long time ago, when you drive, don't stare at the headlights coming at you. Why? Because if that's where you focus, you'll drift that way. Don't focus on, what's that, on the fear. Focus on a promise. You'll be drawn toward the promise of God and away from fear. Over 360 times in the word of God, God says, do not fear. Traditionally, what's the church focus on? Traditionally, they say, don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, don't gamble. Yeah, you can look in the Bible and you can find a scripture on, some, on most of those. Some of those, it's not even there. It's implied, and we get that. And I'm not I'm saying go do any of those things. I'm not. I think we shouldn't. But we focused on those traditionally in the church. And it may or may not have even been mentioned. But 360 times he said, do not fear. But we don't focus on that. Because, you know, the other stuff, it's out there where everybody can see. And the fear's in here. So we're just going to keep that between us, right? We're going to keep that quiet because, hey, nobody sees my fear. Except God. Except God. Because my fear is the absence of faith. Fear is actually faith in failure. It's putting my faith in failure when my faith's supposed to be in God. Y'all with me? Look, this is what Pastor Mike says that has impacted me so much. When I have the temptation to get into fear, Pastor Mike says this, fear is climbing a ladder to the face of a suffering Savior on a cross and telling him, you're a liar and spitting in his face. How about that? Living in fear. When you, when you choose to be bound and living in fear, it's climbing a ladder to the face of a suffering Savior on a cross and saying, you're a liar, I can't trust you. Man, that has impacted me. Because there's no way in the natural I would do that. And I think you feel the same way. But when we get into fear, that's exactly what our actions are doing. We're saying, I can't trust you, God, therefore you must be a liar. For you are with me. That's his faithfulness. He will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. The same spirit that took a dead Jesus, made him alive, and seated him at the right hand of the Father is in me. Did you hear me? The same spirit that took a dead Jesus made him alive, blew a stone away. The, the, that word roll in, the, in our Bible, it says the stone had been rolled away. In the original Hebrew or Greek, it said that had been hurled a great distance. The same spirit that did that and then took that same Jesus who was once dead, made him alive, then ascended him and set him on the throne at the right hand of the Father. He said, now that same spirit 
lives in me. So tell me again who I should fear. Tell me again what I'm supposed to be afraid of. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. Explain to me again where I'm supposed to be afraid. Where does fear fit into that? Where does fear fit into that? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's on there. That's our protection, inspection, and closeness. The rod of the shepherd defends the sheep from attack. That's that stick the shepherds carry. Not the crooked one. That's the staff. But the straight one. The rod was meant to defend the sheep. When that wolf came, that shepherd took that rod and he dealt with that wolf. That staff, that crooked staff, that was used to draw the sheep close to the shepherd. So when the sheep, if there's a sheep, a sheep over there, he could take that crooked stick and he could catch that lamb and he could draw it close to himself. That's my protection. That's my closeness. But here's the thing. That sheep had to stay close enough to the shepherd he could reach him with that stick. I can, I can run away from his protection. And now here's, here's the inspection. He would take that staff and he would catch that sheep. He would pull it to himself. He would take that rod and he would part the wool. And he was looking for parasites. He was looking for ticks and looking for fleas so they could be removed from the sheep because they were sucking the life out of the sheep. God said, if you'll get close enough to me and let me draw you to myself, I will part the wool of your life and I'll look for the things that suck the life out of you and I'll remove them from you if you allow me. If you allow me, I will remove the things that are sucking the life out of you. You ever have things sucking the life out of you? Yes. Yes. God said, you, if you let me, I'll draw you close to me and I'll inspect you. And the things that ought not be there, I'll remove from you. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. That's divine favor. That's supernatural favor. That's the favor of God that rests upon me. And people bless me and they don't even know why. They treat me good and they don't even like me. They just can't help it. That's the favor of God. The divine favor of God. Though people and situations may come against me, I can sit and eat of the goodness of my Father. I'm not shaken. I'm not rattled. Look, when I'm sitting and I'm eating, I'm not shaken and rattled. If I'm shaking and rattled, I'm going to stand and eat or walk and eat. But I'm going to eat. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to eat. I have never been that nervous where I just can't eat. Obviously. But God said, I'll prepare a table for you, right? I'll, I'll treat you right. I'll treat you good. I'll reveal my blessing right in front of your enemies that are trying to keep my blessing away from you. And he said, right in the middle of that, I'll just bless you anyway. And they just got to sit back and watch you be blessed. Hey, that's good. I want to be blessed. I'm not stressed. I'm not shaken and I'm not rattled. Though my enemies may try to cut off my supply, they have to sit back and watch me feast and thrive right before them. I am favored of the Lord, and His favor isn't fair. He will bless me, although someone else seems to be better positioned or more deserving of the blessing. And He will bless me anyway. He will cross over, walk by, bypass hundreds to get to me to bless me. And it's not fair. And they can whine all they want, but I'm a sheep. You hear me? I'm his sheep. A shepherd will walk by all kind of sheep and never pay them any mind, but when he comes to one of his own, well, then he tends to that one. I'm that one. I'm that one. Look, there was a day, I'm just sharing testimony, a testimony. There was a day when I had sent year after year after year my application. And every year I got the same letter back. You are not qualified. And then she talked me into sending it one more time. And they sent me back and said, you've been selected for a test. And I said, well, good, because I'm not going. And she said, yes, you are. And I said, no, 
because they chose me just so they can get their numbers because they already told me I wasn't qualified, she said, but you need to go anyway. So I went. They tested 500 people, and I was their number one pick. I didn't have the degree that they told me I had to have, and I didn't have the experience they told me I needed, and I was the number one pick out of 500. I say that because I'm boasting. No, I'm not boasting. That. Man, come on. That's not me. They bypassed 499 to get to me. My God did that. My God did that. It's not me. I don't take no pride in that. I'm not that smart. But my God says, look, that's one of my sheep. And I'm going to bypass whoever I got to bypass, but I'm going to bless my sheep. And he'll do the same for you. Favor's not fair. I love this one. You anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. The only ones anointed in the Bible were who? Kings and priests. Kings and priests were the only ones anointed. And you are both. Sorry. Revelation 1.6. Oh. And he has made us. Who's us? Are you part of us? You one of us? <laughs> he has made us kings and priests. To his God and Father. Who's he talking about? Jesus has made us. Jesus has made us kings and priests to God and to his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He has made you a king and a priest. I am anointed. Everybody say, I am anointed. I am anointed. To be a priestly king, be a priestly king. And, a priest. and a kingly priest. The oil of his anointing runs down my head. He said, I anoint your head. Do you, ever, do, do, do you know how they anointed? You know, now we anoint, we put a little bit of oil on our finger and we touch them on the forehead. That's not how they anointed in Bible time. They took a big old jar of oil and they dumped that thing on his head and they anointed him and that oil ran down their face and covered their beard and ran down their garments and ran down their arm and dripped from their fingertips and ran down their legs and onto their feet and Everywhere they walked, they left an oily footprint. And everywhere they passed, all dripped from them. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about the anointing of God. God said, I anoint you. And everywhere your feet, feet trod is blessed. And everything you put your hand to prospered because my anointing just got on it. He's talking about you. You leave an oily residue everywhere you go. Recognize it. Recognize it. Recognize it. Everywhere you put your feet is blessed. Because the anointing of God drips off your feet. Everything you touch, isn't that what the scripture says? Whatever they lay their hands to prospers. Why? Because you leave an oily residue of the anointing of God on everything you touch. You want it blessed? Touch it. Lay your hands on the sick. And they, What's that about? What's that laying hands on the sick? Because the anointing runs from you. It symbolizes the anointing of God that drips from you. My boys may not know this, and it may freak them out, but I go in their room when they're sleeping, and I'll just put my hand on them, and I'll speak life, and I'll speak all kind of things into their life. Why? I want to impart the anointing upon them. Picture that oil dripping all over you, covered with that oil, the anointing of God. Makes you so slippery, and the devil tries to catch you, you just slip right out of there like a, like a greased pig. Maybe that wasn't a good analogy. Maybe like a, I don't know, something, what's something cute? Like a grease bunny rabbit? <laughs> oh, I'm anointed for his service. I'm anointed as a king so that I have natural earthly authority. I have authority upon this earth because I'm anointed a king. You too. And as a priest, he's given me spiritual authority. Priest and king. Earthly authority, spiritual authority. You've got both. Because I am a king and a priest, I have the ability to make decrees and they are established. Isn't that what a king does? Job twenty-two twenty-eight. 28. Watch. And you will also declare a thing and it will be established for you. 
You have the right and the ability as an anointed king and priest to declare a thing and it's established. Now that's a two-edged sword. So light will shine on your ways. So light will shine on your ways. That's a two-edged sword though because what you declare is or decree is established. And there's some kings in the Bible that I turned around and bit them because they, they made some foolish decrees. And then they said, uh-oh, I shouldn't have said that. But since I'm a king, it must be done. That's what got John the Baptist beheaded. <clears throat> in a moment of lust, the king was driven away by, by his own lust and desires, and he was enticed, and he made a decree that I'll give you whatever you want. But he wasn't expecting her to say, I want the head of the Baptist. He said, wait a minute. I like that guy, but you're a king, and you made a decree. Watch what you decree, but start decreeing some things. Start making some declarations. Start speaking over your children, over your grandchildren. Start speaking over your finances. Start speaking over your home. Start speaking over your country. Start speaking over your president. Start speaking over your businesses. Start speaking over whatever. Yeah, and if you don't know what to speak... Nat wrote a book. Speak it. Speak the word of God. Make some decrees. My cup runs over. I like that. That's abundance. That's abundance. My cup runs over. That's more than enough. That's enough for me and enough to bless others. Look, it's good if God just meets my need, but that don't help me bless someone else. That's just enough for me. But he called me to bless others. So my cup has to run over. Because I can't let you dip out of my cup because then I don't have enough. So he promises my cup will run over. But if I keep keeping what's running over for me, he, keeps adding, he quits adding to it. But as long as I pick, I, my picture is this. Let people drink out of your saucer. You know, some of y'all remember when they used to use saucers? For you younger ones, that's a little bitty plate. And you used to put your coffee cup on that, and you hold the saucer, and your coffee cup goes on it. Well, if, if, if the Lord did just overflow your coffee cup, you can let other people drink off the saucer. But if you start slapping them away from the saucer, he quits pouring into your cup. You, you see that picture? So as long as you let people gather around your saucer and drink from what's spilling over, well, then he's going to keep pouring into your cup. But if you don't let them drink from that saucer anymore, he's going to say, then why add to it? You already got enough. Follow me? You don't want enough. You want more than enough. He's a God of exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or even dare to imagine. He's a God of pressed down, shaken together, and what? Running over. It's all about bringing glory to him, not about bringing glory to me. It's how he blesses others through me and how he blesses me through others. Press down, good measure, shake, good measure, press down, shake together, running over. I'll cause men to give unto your bosom. See, that's how he plans this. He gives you more than enough to share with me. He gives me more than enough to share with you. He might give me more enough of something that you lack, and he might give you more than enough of something I lack. And then we start sharing this thing, and now we both live in an abundance. It's a reciprocation. But if we ever stop reciprocating, he stops reciprocating to us. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's the blessing. That's the blessing. Goodness and mercy for me and goodness and mercy from me. That's an everyday thing. Every day. Goodness and mercy from God to me. Goodness and mercy from me to others. Every day. No free days. There's no free day. I can't have a free day where I stop showing goodness and mercy to someone else because I don't want God to take a free day from showing goodness and mercy to me. We got that? We don't get time off. We've, we've preached that before, right, Bubba? We don't get that times off. We, we, we forgot about that, though. Oh, we got it? We still remember? Not even a free minute. That, that became like a little inside joke, but it's, there's so much power in that because so many of us, so often, not so many of us, every one of us, often we want to just 
check out of our ministry for just a second, slap a fool, get right back in it, but it don't work that way. We don't get a free minute. That started because I said, you know, every minister needs that one day a year where we have the list of people throughout the year that have just fashe. That's, is that a, you know what I'm talking about? And then we've got that one day where I'm not a preacher this day, so I can go and I can handle you, and then tomorrow we're back in the ministry and glory to God, everything's great. <laughs> it's that jubilee thing. But it don't work that way. God don't, I don't want God working that way with me. Because there's been a lot of days I have a feeling he would just like to just say, boy, good. <laughs> or at least I feel he does. <laughs> or at least I think he ought to. <laughs> but goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. My promise of security. That's the promise that removes the sting from death. That's what makes death not hurt so bad. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's what gives me confidence and assurance and peace about loved ones that have already gone and crossed over into eternity. That's where my peace is, that they're dwelling in the house of the Lord. Now, I know there's some, especially friends of mine that have, have gone, that I don't have that assurance concerning them, and that bothers me. But when I know someone is a child of God and they cross over, the sting from death has been removed. You know, we did a funeral last Sunday afternoon, and that was somebody that was serving God. That was a, a Christian man. So you can go into those times with a confidence saying, Man, this isn't a, something to mourn about. This is a celebration. And that's what they called it. The family even called that a celebration of his life. What, how awesome is that? That's what I want for me. I want people to celebrate me when I'm gone. Celebrate that now I'm receiving the reward that God had for me. Not celebrate me because I was, woo -hoo, But celebrate that I'm gone now and I'm, I'm ex experiencing everything God has for me. And that's what I want you for you also. I want you to have that assurance that when you leave here, when you leave here, I'm not talking about this room, I'm talking about this earth. Because I'm telling you, it could be any day. And I'm not talking about just dying. I'm talking about the rapture of the church could happen any day. And now we're all of a sudden, just like all these events happen like that, well, even faster, the coming of the Lord appears. And now we're going off into eternity like that. The Lord said, as a thief in the night, in the twinkling of an eye, boom. And now what? And now what? Not only do I want you saved, but I want you to have already amassed great wealth of resources there in heaven. I don't want you just to get there. Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Everybody gets to go before the Lord. Everybody gets to go to heaven. Just don't everybody get to stay. And I think the only thing that can make hell worse is that you saw heaven before you went. Because we all have to stand before the Lord and he's not leaving there. So we all go there and he said, I divide my sheep and the goats. Don't be a goat. Hey, don't be a goat. Get your butt out of the way and don't be a goat. I would give my life to God, but there's things I want to do. I would give my life to God, but I'll do that later. Get your butt out of the way before you count it among the goats. Forever. Forever. That's that last, the last thing in that, in that psalm. Forever. That's eternity. That's a long, long time. 
You can't even get your mind to comprehend, comprehend eternity, huh? Because everything we have is uh, chronos. It's time related. Everything has a time related and a life expectancy. But not an eternity. Time's been removed. And now it goes forever. And we, our chronological mind doesn't understand that. Because our mind is incremental. Everything's in increments. Seconds, minutes, hours, years, lifetimes. But it's incremental. But in eternity, there's no increments. That's my eternal security. Make sure you spend it in the house of the Lord. Be a sheep and not a goat. These are just a few of God's promises or purchases for us. Don't be lured out of this and into fear. Don't let loose of what is solid to grab a hold of what is shaken. Don't let drama bring you trauma. Don't release God's word to grab a hold of man's report. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for what? That means nervous, scared, fearful. Anxiety, have anxiety for what? Nothing. No thing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind. See, you can't have the peace of God that surpasses understanding without refusing to be anxious. And without prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. And without making your request be made known unto God. Be anxious for nothing. But pray about everything. Pray for our nation. Pray for our president. And recognize who's behind all this silliness. Recognize it's not the Democrats. It's not the Democrats. I tell you what, go to, go to House of Worship's page or, or, or YouTube. And a, co a few, maybe a month or so ago, I preached a message called The Spirit Behind the Headlines. And watch that again. Listen to it again. But there's a spirit behind this. Recognize your enemy. Don't get distracted in thinking the enemy is, is another political party. That's, that's a distraction. Somebody said the other day, he doesn't have any new tricks. My response was, he don't need them. We keep falling for the same ones. Why would he need a new, tr new trick? We fall for the same ones. Recognize your enemy and take authority over him.